What's up, Hospitality MD viewers? It's Kyle back with another episode of our podcast interview series presented right here on YouTube. Before we get started, subscribe to the channel, turn on notifications for this channel, like this video, comment on this video, and share this video. We're on location this week at the Sable Hotel, a curio collection by Hilton at Navy Pier in downtown Chicago. This hotel has 223 beautiful guest rooms and the largest rooftop bar in North America. We had the pleasure of sitting down with Laurent Boyce, the general manager of the hotel, and this is probably one of the most insightful interviews we've done in one of the most beautiful locations we've ever filmed. So sit back, relax, and enjoy. We'll see you at the end of the video. Well, Laurent, my first question for you is regarding your enunciation moment into hospitality. Um, I think, you know, for most people that we talk to, there's something that if you go back as far as you remember, even to when you were a kid, that you thought to yourself, wow, hospitality is special, or even hotels particularly are, are special places, um, because you don't get to where you are without having that something sure. in your heart. So tell me about that. Uh, well, I think it started, you know, with my family, right? Obviously, I'm from France, uh, and uh, those Sunday long lunch, you know, with the grandparents and my brothers and my family. So we had extensive lunch, and usually brought to conversation, you know, in France we talk about politics and we talk about everything, right? And those are very long conversation, but always with food and beverage, you know. Mm -hmm. and, and I think. For me, as a young age, I was, you know, uh, with my family, you know, experiencing that. And, and, uh, uh, and also after that, you know, uh, my grand aunt in France had a restaurant uh, on the coastal. Oh, okay. So at young age, I started to work for them, you know, just for fun, like selling ice cream, you know, on the stand parlor and things like this. And, and then this became a habit, you know, to be there for the summer months and make some few uh, bucks, you know, and, and uh, they invited me to come back. And one day I remember my father wanted to organize a lunch at home and, and talk about hospitality business. You know, my career was either hospitality or music. Uh, and I happened to do both for a long time. And then I choose hospitality because I think my family and my experience in the business at the time at young age, and, and I felt uh, that one, I could, you know, survive, <laughs> <laughs> yes, <laughs> make some money. And at young age, when you get all those tips, you know, and at the time, you know, there was uh, Americans coming to France and spending a lot of money in restaurants and, and having a beautiful experience. So I thought that was kind of fun. And, and then I just wanted to, to, to travel, which was, you know, at young age, it's always very aspiring to say, oh, where am I going to go next, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, so between my family, my uh, experience in those restaurants, you know, family restaurants, and then I decided to do the hospitality school in France uh, and then graduated in France. Very good. I, I have to say this because similarly for me, my two loves music and hospitality. Really? Wow. Yes. Yeah, so I was actually going to, I had a scholarship to actually play orchestral double bass at a school, but um you know, music performance versus yeah. hospitality. I ended up going the hospitality route. I That's still enjoy music as a hobby, but what what's your instrument, or is it voice? Or? Voice, yes, okay. yes. So uh, I started singing. You know, when I was very young, like at uh, eight years old, up to twenty, uh, because I was still studying in France. And before I moved abroad, so I moved to Spain. My first uh, assignment was in Barcelona. Uh, at Le Meridien, which was a Starwood property at the time mm -hmm. and still is. Uh, and it was great, you know, and then because of, as you know, food and beverage, so I started my career in food and beverage and obviously you spent so many hours working. So uh, I had to give up a little bit uh, mm -hmm. voice, but, uh, you know, you can still sing in the shower, for example, <laughs> in your car, right? So yeah. that was kind of cool. So do you still sing? You still like to, to I do practice? for myself. Uh, I did recently, you know, uh, I work in the Philippines previous to this job. Mm -hmm. So uh, the previous owners were very, you know, art uh, focused and music as well. So 
I remember that they invited me to sing for a performance, you know, at the Conrad Manila, which was great, right? So it was that a is French so cool. evening with art and and they had an orchestra and small orchestra and then they invited me to sing, which was totally unplanned, you know, it was like kind of cool and and uh yeah. No, Sometimes I do, cool. but uh, not often. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I'm sure the hotel here is keeping you busy enough. <laughs> yes, you know, that's keeping right. a lot of your your Absolutely. time. So tell me, tell me about your about coming up in the business. Mm-hmm. Um, the food and beverage track that you have, I think, is significant. Um, actually, recently, Greg he 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 tagged me in something on LinkedIn. It was a, I think he was from the Middle East, a famous hotelier. I can't remember his name, but he said. A great director of rooms will get you uh, 80% profitability. A very bad director of rooms will get you 65% profitability still. Mm-hmm. Uh, a great director of food and beverage will only get you 20% profitability. And a bad director of food and beverage, you'll wow. lose money. And he said, <laughs> you know, what separates the best hotels in the world from, you know, just the rest of them? A compelling and, uh, you know, amazing food and beverage concept. Mm-hmm. So I think it, it uh, you know, it, it can't be understated the significance of food and beverage, especially in luxury hospitality. So I'm interested to know how you came up and how your food and be- beverage background really set you up for success. Yeah, I think uh, so all those ratios, you know, uh, obviously we can discuss, but I think food and beverage for me is a differentiator. Uh, I work in different continents and, and countries and hotels and, and usually large food and beverage operation, which I kind of enjoy because you can be creative, right? And you can come up with uh, ideas and, and really add value to the hotel. A room is a room, not like this one. This one is amazing, right? Yes. It's the view and everything and look at that view. Uh, being in Chicago, but some are more cookie cutter hotels, and and I think you know the added value is F and B can be you know creating events, uh, play with the space, you know what is your offering in food and beverage, in breakfast, lunch, and dinner, the bar, you know, I mean there's so many things you can add and change. Uh, so I think it has been to my advantage uh, for now, right? Uh, for my mm-hmm. last 28 years experience in hospitality in all those different countries, which I'm very thankful for, and also bring you um, um, you know, you, you embrace the culture of the country, so you also gain knowledge, right? It's not just an American restaurant, but then you start adding those little things here and there, right? What else can you do? So if you work for a French company or in Asia or an American company, it will be a different thinking of food and beverage, uh, but the room is the room. <clears throat> so I think uh, for me, it has worked. Uh, mm-hmm. That's really my background in operation. Uh, and uh, through my career, I was able to advance through food and beverage till someone gave me the opportunity to be the hotel of operation, uh, which happened to be in Miami. So also big hotel with food and beverage, but then uh, in Chicago, I was trained to work in rooms as well. So all combined made me, you know, to try and uh, been successful since, Mm -hmm. because I think it's beyond that, you know, it's really hiring the right people in the right position, uh, being creative, we talked about that, agile. There is so many components, right? And as you know, as a general manager, you have to manage different expectations with the employees, but also the guests, uh, the management company, right? Uh, And the owners. And in this case, you know, you also have Navy Pier in Chicago. So there's a lot of stakeholders that you have to play with and work with uh, to make sure this is a, you know, property that... uh, we want maximum, you know, people to experience the hotel and the FNB. So it has worked. So you bring up a great point in that general manager role. I mean, it's and it's hard because I mean, I experience this myself. Very, uh, it's hard to prepare yourself for uh, for what you'll experience mm-hmm. when you are the one who is kind of that point of contact for all the stakeholders. I mean. Uh, for uh, I guess sake of of generality, we'll say we have the team of the hotel, the guests of the hotel, and we have the owners and corporate office. We can mm-hmm. put them into one. Um, how do you 
uh, how do you prioritize those um, juggling priorities and relationships? And um, you know, do you have any advice for anybody who uh, may be struggling with that, or even as they prepare to take something like that on? How how do you approach that? Yeah, so I think when you you get your first general manager job or second or third, you know, you still think you're not prepared fully, right? Because it's the unknown. Uh, obviously, if you work like I did in different countries and in different ownership group brands, uh, you tend to be more agile and I would say comes with experience. So coming here back to Chicago, obviously totally new as well, right? And I would say even more complex because we do have a management uh, company and ownership group. Uh, so you really have to embrace it, you know, and you have to, to take care of it uh, all at the same time. You can't just differentiate employees, guests and owners mm -hmm. and brand because it would be like, so you prioritize, but on the same time, you have to tackle every stakeholder uh, at once. Right, because I mean, you could, I, I think, and you probably experience this as well, when you're not a GM mm -hmm. uh, and you're an employee of the hotel, even if you're in a middle management position, mm -hmm. you can sometimes <clears throat> you know, say to yourself, I know I have, you know, if I were the GM, I would have made a different call or, um, right. or, or something like that where you, where you feel like maybe the, the GM isn't doing things the way you would mm -hmm. personally do it. But then it's not until you realize the pressure coming from the other side or the expectations yeah. from the other side that you think, well, maybe, you know, that was the best decision that could have been mm -hmm. made for everybody. Um, so I think, you know, first you have to stay calm, right? And, yes. and strategize and prioritize. And I think, you know, tells like any other business, there is a set of KPIs, right? That you have to achieve obviously and, and internally uh, educate the employees on how to achieve and, and what is the goal, right? So, uh, I like to have a roadmap, you know, and where I'm going. So this is a pre-opening hotel, which is totally different than taking over uh, an existing hotel. So in this case, it's very clear, right? I'm the first general manager, so we set the tone for the future. And uh, there is some KPI that needs to be achieved. Can be related to employees, obviously, but customers and, you know, like we discussed, uh, profitability earlier and and uh, ownership relationship, uh, same as the management company. So uh, if you have that kind of thinking for each box, let's say, uh, and you focus on those, you should be successful with the right people surrounding you in the hotel. So you've, you've said this now a couple of times. I think mm -hmm. you, you really are emphasizing the team that you build mm -hmm. and the people that you surround yourself with. So. Tell me about that significance to you. I, I think it'd also be important, you know, if you're building a world-class team um, and maybe somebody listening is wanting to build a world-class team of their own, what advice do you have for them? What do you look for when you're, when you're interviewing, hiring, recruiting? Tell us about your team building philosophy and your management style. So I think you want a diverse team, which is very important to me. A good mix of people, uh, different horizon, different brands. Obviously, you know, we are Hilton brand, so we would prefer Hilton employees because they are trained, you know, with the systems and know a bit of the culture, especially if you work for Corio Collection, which is a sub brand, right? But uh, we also look at the attitude, right? We also look at the profile of each individual. And, and we, we, I want to make sure that the person who is interviewing really wants to be here, uh -huh. especially now with the pandemic. Some people are applying and jumping on opportunities, but not necessarily want to be here, or they just want to be here three months, and then they go back to their previous job, or they have another thinking you know, afterwards. So, we are careful with that. Um, also using your influence, right? Uh, I think through LinkedIn, through social media platform, through conversation like this, uh, looking at who could be a good fit for this hotel, mm -hmm. uh, which has been successful for me in my case, because I work in different hotels in Chicago. So I already have a network of people that had joined me pre-opening. And then those people, the leadership team is also looking for their own team, right? So it starts at the top and really uh, each one of them 
look for their own departments, you know, and, and we all help each other to look for the talents. So it has been um, a bit difficult, for example, for the housekeeping department for this hotel sure. since we opened in March, which uh, again was pandemic and still is pandemic. But we were able to find through different director of housekeeping and you know hotel managers um, contacts, you know personal contacts, and and uh, and I think a lot of people want to work here. <laughs> it's such a beautiful hotel, such a great location, such. Uh, great team to be with and learn from so uh, we have not been too much in a short you know short staff uh, experience yet we have been steadily growing our numbers you know we are very cautious on who we hired and how many we hired when we opened the hotel uh, and gradually you know growing the team especially at the peak this summer july august and September is still strong for us. So uh, it's really being careful and cautious. It goes back to that KPI, right? And, mm-hmm. and the profitability and, and the satisfaction, the guest satisfaction and the experience. So you have to be careful. You just, I, I would love to have 100 employees at the hotel, <laughs> right? But the reality is you can't. So how can you make it happen? Being cautious, having the best employees uh, and the talent. Uh, and it comes from, I think, all Chicago is using the same pool of talent anyway, right? So <clears throat> you just need to be different, uh, sell your story, uh, have a beautiful property like this in the right location, and you should be attracting talent uh, and want it to work for that uh, organization as well. Yeah, I think it's significant what you said, you know, that. Uh, particularly in housekeeping, for example, which has become a massive pain point for everybody, um, that you haven't felt the same strain that a lot of other hotels, even within the same market here in Mm -hmm. Chicago, have been feeling in terms of lack of staff Mm -hmm. or quality of staff. Um, But then when I start to, to think about it and I hear what you said and I look around, well, you know, off the record, we talked about you uh, being very aggressive with the rate, Mm -hmm. which maybe uh, for for people listening or on a higher level, you might think, well, how does that impact the housekeepers, right? Well, if a higher rate and, you know, the clientele who stays, they don't, they don't trash the room perhaps, mm-hmm. and now it makes their job easier. So every day the experience of the housekeeper is better. Um, and if it's better for them, they'll stay longer and they might tell their friend to come and work here as well mm-hmm. because they can vouch for that good experience. Uh, if you have a great preventative maintenance program in the hotel as well, and they know that the rooms are going to be in great condition, um, and that means that it's going to be easier for them to clean, then that's another great experience that adds up to the value of the housekeeper. Um, would you credit any of those decisions that you've made to to how that has worked for your housekeeping department? Uh I think, you know, when we opened the hotel, <clears throat> it was very difficult. Obviously, we had no sure. visibility and the pier was closed at the time in March uh, 2020. Uh, 20. So we decided to do that soft open in March 18. We opened March 18 and we started with single digit occupancy. <clears throat> but what made us hope was our weekend, our strong, you know, weekend, Friday, Saturday, Sunday here. And the reality is, and at the time we had not enough housekeepers, you know, I was with my team working together to make beds till 11.30 p.m. on Saturday. <coughs> and we did it for like two months, two, three months, consistently every weekend. We knew we didn't have enough housekeepers to work here. And I guess the word spread out, you know, uh, people want to work here because you also work with them. You know, you 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 lead by example. You... So suddenly we, the team started to grow and, you know, room attendants uh, tell their, the other room attendant from other hotel and they came here. And I have to say, it's a very busy hotel here. So for them to stay is also, you know, like... Now that's the you, significant you would part. They decide to maybe go or try another hotel, yeah. right? In this case, they decided to stay because I think we have a good team. Again, the leadership team is helping them. You know, we have a good uh, process and it's not an easy property in the sense that we have three bays, three towers, right? It's not a single tower with 223 rooms, it's three. 
So the logistic is defi definitely more difficult than any other property I would have worked before, right? But with that team spirit and everybody working together and really, you know, working together, especially heavy weekend, Saturday, Sunday, uh, everybody is here working. Uh, so, you know, we are not afraid to help them and be highly visible, you know, to, so really by example, not only me, but the team, you know, the hotel manager, the f director of guest services, the director of housekeeping, everybody's on the floor on weekend to make sure that the guest has the best experience and, and you know, maintaining our high standards with the room attendant and the houseman to, to make sure that they do the best with providing them with the tools, very important, right? Uh, we don't have a laundry here, so we outsource, right? right? And, and Which for those listening, I will say this is not uncommon in correct. the city of Chicago. So just for anybody who might be thinking, what, they don't have a laundry facility? Right. Very, very, very commonplace here in the city. Um, yes. I don't know if I've... I've only worked at one hotel in this city that has had on-site laundry. Mm -hmm. Anyway, just a side note for the <laughs> listeners. Go ahead. I used to work at a hotel in O'Hare who had a laundry facility. Mm -hmm. So uh, in this case, we don't have. So we outsource everything, which is another challenge. You know, we, we talk about uh, short staff, but there are also short staff, which create uh, stress for the hotel, but for the ladies specifically, right? To make the room on time, for example. And for the guests to get their room on time, our checking time is 4 p.m. So we want to make sure that, and we do it, you know, now we have it uh, ready by four o'clock. Uh, but at the beginning, it has been a challenge, you know. Uh, well, if you don't have clean linen, you can't have clean rooms. Right, it's or a... we would have clean linen, but not enough, mm -hmm. or the delivery would be scheduled or postponed to the evening instead of the afternoon. So all that you have to anticipate, you know, to the best of your ability and, and make sure the ladies understand. So for me, transparency is key, you know, when you have the morning meeting and you tell them up front. So they are not disappointed to hear, you know, at 4 p.m. when they're supposed to leave at 5, that, oh, the linen will be coming later and they are basically waiting uh, and stuck, you know, in, in their mind with that. So we are very transparent. Mm -hmm. We communicate uh, with them, not only housekeeping, but all the departments and the morning meeting. And in transparency and communication, I think, is very important. So um, when I think of a luxury general manager, mm -hmm. I think of somebody who's in an ivory tower somewhere who's mm -hmm. who maybe I, I don't see them. You know, if I'm an employee of the hotel, maybe they don't speak to guests very often. Um, that, that's what that's what comes to my mind. Right. Uh, what I'm finding in our conversation is that you don't seem to be that type of general manager in, in your style. It mm -hmm. sounds like you're present at meetings mm -hmm. uh, with the staff. I mean, you're here on the weekends, which is significant mm -hmm. in and of itself, let alone here on the weekends, making beds and participating in the daily operations to provide the best experience. Um, and obviously, as you mentioned, that's trickling down to the executive committee and then to the um, the rest of the team. Um, is this something that you've always done? Because I and we didn't really get too much into it, but you've worked in five-star uh, properties internationally. I mean, uh, you mentioned Manila, Conrad Manila, right? Which um, probably had m more rooms than this, so bigger hotels. Is, is this unique to this property in the way that you've adjusted your style or has this been consistent for you regardless of the location or size of the property? No, it has been consistent to me and I think because of my background in food and beverage, I usually tend to be here, you know, Friday, Saturday for events, uh, weddings or anything, right? Anything big and, um, you know, I in this hotel, our peak night is usually Friday, Saturday. So why the general manager will not be here, right, when it's busy? <laughs> and it's a good point. Some people say, oh, you're working on the weekend. Well, I'm actually enjoying working on the weekend because this is where you can see, you know, the fruit of your labor, right? To be sell out consistently on a Friday night, on a Saturday night, sometime on Sunday, like last weekend. Uh, it tells a lot from the team, right, to really do all that. 
so I think, um, yeah, it's my philosophy that you have to be here on weekends uh, as a general manager because you want to be with the team and, and celebrate the successes, but also really participate and, and help them achieving uh, those successes. So maybe not every weekend, it has been more like this, but mm -hmm. uh, uh, I think it's important to be here when the business demands to, to be at the hotel. Which is very, um, it, it, it's, it makes sense. It, it's, the, it's, the, it's the most common sense answer. If you are running a hotel, Correct. you are there when the hotel right. needs to be run at its most efficient uh, and at its most satisfactory for the guests. And um, same with the leadership team. You know, when we <clears throat> do scheduling, we always look to make sure there is enough coverage in management to support the team, obviously, right? Uh, and even if it's a small team, we're not a big team, but we have enough to make sure that uh, the guest is taken care of. And even psychologically for the team, if you are not here when it's busy and they have wins and they look around the room and they don't see you, maybe they don't think, oh, my GM's not here right now because most people are accepting. If you were to never work a weekend, I don't think anybody would say Correct. he never works a weekend because that's the expectation. Mm -hmm. But again, psychologically, if they look around the room, they don't see you, then they associate these wins as being independent of you. On the contrary, if they look around and they see these wins and you're right there beside them um, or you played a role in it, now it's it's. Uh, I think it strengthens the fabric of the team. Um, and now they associate winning with you and with your leadership and your contributions. Yeah, and even this weekend, you know, Labor Day weekend. So, uh, and every weekend, not only this particular weekend, but the success of this weekend is we had three sellouts in a row, right? Uh, I think so, they call that a turkey, right? That's a <laughs> <laughs> so it's kind of nice that, you know, the director of revenue generation, for example, starting texting and say, okay, we're full, you know, great job and on upselling and... Uh, the front desk and the operation team, right, obviously, to deliver that. So there is that sense of, you know, camaraderie and family that everybody cares. Even if you're not at a hotel, you still care to look at the number and say, like, wow, you know, great uh, result and great achievement. So I think that's important that the team think like this. Uh, they all take ownership, you know, of their responsibility and, and functionality of the hotel. And at the end, you know, all those people make it happen. And this is the success of the hotel. That's a highly engaged team mm -hmm. right there, especially like you said, if they're not at the hotel, but even looking at that. And then even like you said, Labor Day weekend, this is when most people will be kicking back by the pool, right. not even thinking about work, but it's everybody cares Absolutely. that there's a success here mm -hmm. for everybody and that the guests are happy. So one of the major objections, I think, as, as we talk about the general manager working on the weekends and being here in the off hours, one of the objections that, that may be common from a GM who is resistant to that, um, it goes back a little bit to those juggling of the priorities. They might say, well, I need to be here Monday through Friday mm -hmm. because that's when the corporate office uh, is open and that's when I, I need to be uh, able to be in touch with with the corporate office and the owners if I'm there on the weekend at 11:30 making beds how are how's the corporate office going to get a hold of me what do you say to that well that's a good question because I was also you know asked to be on a call on a, I forget which day on a Wednesday or something and and uh, I declined the call I said unfortunately I will uh, be off on that day because I work on weekends and I'm sure you will appreciate that I'm here when it's busy and uh, it worked well so they took it very well you know they, they were actually very thankful and postponed the call to another day right so I think if you explain and you are transparent uh, and if you know it makes sense you know to you and your business uh, I would encourage people to to do it. You know, uh, there's no reason why it would work for me and not others. So, and there's no science. You know, another hotel I may choose to work Monday through Friday because mm -hmm. it's a different setup and we are not on EVP here when uh, <laughs> right. the weekend yeah. are extremely busy here with the food traffic and all. So I think it depends again, right? But uh, so far in my previous jobs and opportunities, I usually work. Uh, Friday, definitely, and Saturday. Mm -hmm. 
uh, but it may vary, right? If it's a holiday, uh, if it's, uh, you know, heavy checkout time, you know, things like this. So there's business uh, that will prompt you to, uh, to choose uh, those particular days. So every week you look at your forecast and you actually say to yourself, okay, when should I be here and when shouldn't I be here? And mm-hmm. you actually have that internal dialogue with yourself and I'm sure probably with your team as well. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I guess it's, it's, and of course you, you know the pattern by now, like we said, the weekend right, is busy. Exactly. So you, you pretty much know, but I guess my, my point is that you are open to a fluctuating schedule just like the rest of the hotel team. Yes. Um, based on business needs, mm-hmm. which is which is very unique. Um, do you recognize that that's unique? It I'm is. sure you've been around uh, a lot of GMs. I also know a lot of general managers that do the same. You sure. Know, and, uh, but the majority, most likely not. Uh, and what's important to me is that there is always management coverage for any situation that may happen, right? So if I'm not here, then there will be someone else here. Uh, there is always a liaison to make sure that... Uh, and when I'm off, I'm off, which is another thing, yeah. right? And I expect the same with my team. So I try not to send email when they are off. I try to resolve anything that comes my way if they are off in their department because they are off, right? So they're supposed to really uh, enjoy their time with their family or anything they may have to do. Uh, so the least pressure we can give them, so they really enjoy their two days off consecutively, which I think is important, mm-hmm. uh, is best. So they come back refreshed, they come back excited, happy, they tell you the stories, what they've done for the last two days, and I think uh, it has worked well so far. So small teams, small, you know, we can have those conversations case by case, and it has paid off uh, for, for us, right? Uh, or personal life, but also when we are at work, we are much more uh, efficient and, and focus on, on what we need to deliver. I really, really, one of the, I think one of my favorite things you said so far is in regards to the email, not sending the emails while they're off. Try not to. Try not to. <laughs> yes. Well, yeah, so we'll say most of the time that you, you, you don't, or at least you're conscious of right. it. And I think that's highly significant because I'm even guilty of this myself too. If I know that somebody's off, if if they were there, I would have gone and spoken to them face to face because if I don't have to send an email, I won't. I'll just find them and I'll talk to them about this. Um, So it's most of the time is when they're off that I'm ready to send an email. But but what I don't think about so much, and I'm sure, and I know this because a lot of people have done this to me, sending me emails all the time, is when your email is on your phone and it's everywhere with you you get that that notification right. and you you look at it or maybe you feel oh my gosh do i have to respond now or is there a certain expectation because the the lines are blurry because you're always mm-hmm. you're attached to your work especially when you're in an executive committee role or a management position um, or even especially in middle management too, if it's texting or calling or emails, or whatever. So the fact that you're uh, consciously making an effort to, to not send emails if you can while somebody's off, I think is very emotionally intelligent of you um, because it's a valid concern for the industry. And when we talk about hiring uh, uh, crisis and what is it, uh, it's not a wage issue so much so in my opinion. I mean, I think in some markets it is. You know, if you're in a, uh, a La Quinta off the highway in a right. rural, you know, countryside, yeah, it might be a wage issue, but it's a wage issue for the entire town, whatever your employee is. But in, in if you know, in, in this hotel, paying probably close to $20, $22, $23 an hour for mm-hmm. an hourly associate, um, and th- that's a great weight rage uh, for, for somebody. So if there was a struggle to hire somebody and it's not in regards to pay, what could it be? Well, maybe it's because when they're off, they're always getting emails and they can't spend time with their family or somebody's always calling them. So those little actions I think are hugely significant to um, just a, a long-term sustainable culture that will bring the hotel into its maturity, I think, in a lot better. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Um, so 
speaking of which, Hotel is is young. It's new. Um, I guess it could be considered immature to a certain extent as it's in its early stages. Um, what are you doing and, and what insights can you provide to anybody who's in a pre-opening or a, especially as this so many transactions with hotels taking place, redevelopments, rebrandings, new positionings, ownership and management company changes, pre it's all kind of in the same vein of, of starting something fresh. What advice do you have or, or uh, <clears throat> sentiments do you have on getting off on the right foot and setting up for long-term success? Mm. So that's a very good question. So we, I was hired uh, in uh, July 2019, right, to open, uh, 2020, sorry, to open November, right, uh, 2020. So at the time it was a very small team, uh, myself, the director of revenue generation, and we had the CEO of, of the hotel, right? Uh, the three of us working together to come up with the plan, right? Post opening, uh, which entail obviously, you know, FFNE and all the things that we, and, you know, rate right strategy and, and understanding the Hilton words and how that works and, you know, really immediately starting to look for business, right? So. The three of us, that's what we worked on, and we had a roadmap for that. Uh, and another team was working for Food and Beverage. Um, so uh, it's preparation, I think, right? The success of an opening is preparation, is having the right people. And because it was pandemic, it was definitely much more challenging because you, we, we were like three, four, five people pre-opening mm -hmm. instead of maybe 20, right? Uh, so everybody had to do more in their plates, uh, but you had a fantastic view like this every day, right? To, to work with. <laughs> it makes so it a lot nice. easier. <laughs> uh, and then we, the opening was postponed. It was supposed to be November, and then Navy Pier decided to not open because of, you know, reopen in uh, April. So we took a risk and decided to open in March, actually, mm -hmm. prior to Navy Pier, and I was the only location open on the pier at the time. So we've decided to do a campaign and I have a very strong marketing manager here, very creative, and we all work as a team and come up with those campaign. And, and, and the campaign was, we've got space, right? Obviously we've got a lot of space on Navy Pier. It's closed and empty. And why don't you come and experience the pier when it, it is in that situation? Wow, fascinating, uh, right? So we turn it around, right? And it's like we took this as an advantage and say, we're going to fill up our weekend with that. We've got space, space package, and, and we did. And it was really a success, and people came in the middle of May, um, sorry, March, we opened March 18. Uh, our second weekend uh, was very promising because we've started seeing people walking at the hotel just for that package, mm -hmm. which included room and F&B component and and uh, more, but and the rooftop was open also. So uh, you have to be creative, right? You, marketing is definitely key. I mean, everywhere I worked, you want to have a very strong marketing. Some people cut the marketing dollars. Yes. Uh, because they think, you know, it's not, uh, no, we, we feel strongly that it brings us an edge. You know, our campaign, uh, we are creative, the messaging is creative, uh, so I'm very proud of that, that we have a very strong team working together collaboratively with FNB and revenue management, so it's really a team effort to come up with those campaigns and, and fill up those gaps, you know, uh, or weekends, or when you, sleep, when you see a dip in the business demand, then you, you have to come up with something uh, interesting, not the typical, you know, woman breakfast, for example. Well, I think like this is, I haven't heard very many people talking about this in the industry, but I think it's significant. The value, like if you look back to what the value of a brand was mm -hmm. 30 years ago, you have an 800 number, you have a website that they, they have for you. Well, it doesn't really matter so much anymore. Like that value necessarily of just having a website or having a phone number that people can call and make reservations. So when we talk about modern day hotel marketing, and you're right, a lot of people will cut those, that, those dollars out or it's not a position that they feel is important or 
the I've heard this so many times from owners is how do we how do we track the ROI on, on a marketing yes. person? It's so blurry. How can we how can we say what the ROI on this investment is? Um, what's what's your response to that? How would you uh, how would you persuade an owner to invest in marketing? Um, and and a follow up question that would be: What, in your opinion, is the fundamental difference between we have a director of sales and we have a director of marketing? Because mm-hmm. I think sometimes people might say, "Well, we don't need marketing; we have a director of sales." Right. So, which is a different skill set, right? Mm-hmm. So, in our property, we have a director of sales or business development, really looking uh, to to the business, right? The future bookings and hunting the business and and having those groups coming into the hotel or any initiative to get more revenue in the hotel for the room side. But the marketing is the creativity, right? And it's uh, it's usually someone that uh, has a very strong, can be the voice of the hotel. So in our case, uh, she's terrific because she was part of the pre-opening and, and did the branding and the messaging of the hotel, right? So. We created the brand guideline. We, it's a young company, Maverick Hotel and uh, Restaurants is our management company. So very young, but uh, also very talented in that aspect. They hire good people, or they believe in those skill set, for example, right? So I had not much difficulty to convince that company to hire a marketing manager because they immediately see the benefit of doing that. So, so that was an initiative that you pushed for? Yes. Okay. I really pushed to have that position, and, and it happened that that person was also in front of me, and I'm like, well, maybe she should be working for us because she has such a good voice for the hotel and creativity sense and, and a very talented person as well. So all combined, you know, that position was in front of me, and that person was right there, right? So I was fortunate to have that but in my previous experience, I also had you know that functionality for the hotel uh, because it's, it's beyond that also, right? You have all those OTAs, the content. You know, we want to make sure we reach hundred percent of image and the photography, and uh, but also more importantly for me is the voice, right? It's someone that understands uh, the brand, the hotel, the expectation, and can translate this into that. Sable at Navy Pier voice, uh, and she will be the one answering, for example, reviews and platform mm-hmm. like this, and, and any concern or issues or inquiry as well, right? Uh, we also have our own vanity site, sablehotel.com, so this was also created pre opening with uh, an outsource company but if you look at the website it's so nicely designed and you want to be here right so it has to be inspiring uh, and that person that functionality is definitely promoting that as well and i've noticed as well in in the marketing um there was i think you'll have to you'll have to correct me if i'm wrong here but i recall two separate marketing campaigns one for the guest and one for hiring Mm -hmm. i think one was like uh make waves at navy pier and and that was for the hiring and then another one was like set sail at navy pier perhaps Mm -hmm. and that was for the guests Mm -hmm. who were coming in and when i saw that and this was Mm -hmm. before like i even can we we even reached out for the interview um and i saw that and i said wow that's really i really consciously thought to myself i i think that's smart and creative um to have those two independent marketing campaigns, if you will, or, or at least those taglines to attract the talent that you need to attract the guests that mm-hmm. you want as well. Um, so credit to Getty's who help us pre-opening to, mm-hmm. to come up with all that uh, brand guidelines, which is the messaging. And obviously now we use those taglines for hiring, for weddings, for you know inspiring customer to come here uh, at Sable and experience the hotel. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, the food and beverage component here is significant as well, and it kind of leans into your background a little bit more. This hotel has the largest rooftop bar in the country, is it? Mm-hmm. That's correct. Yes. So the rooftop bar offshore. 
So Maverick Hotel and Restaurant, so I have two divisions, hotel mm-hmm. division and restaurant division. So I'm actually not in charge of food and beverage. I have a counterpart who oversees food and beverage for the restaurant and the rooftop bar, uh, another project for Maverick. Uh, so, but we work together, collaborate. And it's the right? same company. same company, it's just a different division and Correct. they want to make that distinction. Yes. As a business choice that yes. we operate these restaurants and food and beverage and Absolutely. meat. And they'll do catering and events uh, do. as well? Mm-hmm. Okay. From the restaurant. So it's a different thinking of having in a traditional hotel that banquet uh, team and banquet chef. And, you know, so right. here it would be from the restaurant chef uh, catering to uh, the event space. I think that creativity is probably beneficial and if it hasn't already panned out I know events have been slow uh, you know with the pandemic but I'm sure it will because I think one of the critical things now in this post pandemic hotel universe is going to be hotel leaders and GM specifically who are strong operators and who can do what you're doing and get in there and be there when it's busy um, because the teams are smaller mm-hmm. um, ownership isn't approving all of those fluffy positions mm-hmm. and you know all these mm-hmm. managers to be there and it's going to be a long time if ever before that ever comes back so strong operators who aren't afraid to get their hands dirty and then creative ways to you know if you have a, a strong culinary talent who's cooking primarily out of the restaurant why why shouldn't they be able to create a menu for for an event and execute that why do you need another highly expensive chef salary for a banquet chef or or you know a banquet sous chef when you could just kind of combine and do that especially if it works for your business um are these things that you're you guys are consciously thinking about in terms of long-term strategy we look at synergy as well right Mm -hmm. so offshore kitchen and lyrica kitchen you know same chef active Mm -hmm. chef right that can do both so it's important to look at that, uh, not only for cost saving, which I would like to mention, but more for, you know, also give an opportunity to people to shine, right? Uh, so it could be a progression, career progression, but also it just makes sense business-wise to, to start thinking like this, especially in that pandemic uh, or, or slow down business. We always look at, you know, what else can we do next and, and see how we can merge or uh, who can assist another department to not necessarily hire uh, because we just can't, right? So we have to be creative also in that aspect uh, and starting using our talent internally and you know see who can do more, uh, which can add at the end to uh, career progression or you know give an opportunity to someone to experience another department, uh, which I think is beneficial long term. It seems to contradict the uh, traditional luxury doctrine of mm-hmm. a very highly specialized mm-hmm. role for each person, mm-hmm. um, which I'm sure you experience maybe overseas and even here in your previous luxury experience uh, as you were coming up through the business of that really, really highly concentrated role mm-hmm. for every person. Now changing into the the generalists are going to be thriving more so uh, in the, in this, um, you know, new hotel industry that we come mm-hmm. uh, in. So you mentioned something that um, really kind of captured my attention, which was uh, the kind of uh, complexing of the roles. You you do it yes for cost savings, but you said I don't really like to talk about that too much or really emphasize that. Um, Okay, let's let's go into that a little bit further. There's seems to be two schools of thought. Uh, one of which is that you can cost cut your way to profitability, right? And the other one is uh, maybe a little bit less popular in the general consensus, which is uh, a more top line revenue focused approach. Um, and you you drive your way to profitability through driving and increasing revenues. I think I have a feeling which school of thought that you belong to, but tell me which one 
or if there's a different one that I don't know about and why that is, so what, what your philosophy yeah, on that? Yeah, maybe it's both actually because, you know, uh, I tend to always look at the top line first and see how we can actually increase our top line, what kind of ideas we can uh, and how can we generate more revenue for, for the hotel because it should flow, you know, to our GOP uh, better, especially in the room side. Uh, so... Having said that, it's also pandemic, right? So we may sure. not reach our forecast uh, or, you know, we might see a dip uh, midweek, for example, and then we look at uh, right sizing or uh, looking at opportunity to save. Uh, it can be on, but without compromising quality, which I think is important to me. Uh, so for example, you know, we have uh, orchids on every uh, guest floors, right? So is there a way to change that orchid, still an orchid, but maybe not the same price of what we're paying now? And look at all those opportunities. So those are very much details, you know, on a PNL that you look at every line and you're like, okay, so what can we do to still have our linen, right? But is there a way to decrease uh, the expense? or anything like this, right? So every department manager uh, is really, it's a conversation. There are tasks to look at that or avoiding over time. For example, when we, you know you don't have a strong business on the books, for example. So uh, I think both are very important, but always look at the top line first, you know, how we can get better. And, and even if our forecast is done, what else can I do to, to beat the forecast? So that would be my priority uh, as a operator. Yeah, because I, I think rather than you know like cutting the orchids completely mm -hmm. or or taking a body away from mm -hmm. from the operation, for example, and and to to really aggressively cost cut your way to profitability, as as some mm -hmm. will do, um, this seems to be a much more nuanced. Uh, you know, like. It's easy to to say no. This person's not going to be on the schedule. We'll just deal with the guest complaints or or whatever, mm -hmm. or or we'll make it happen, or we'll work the salary manager into the ground as a result uh, of of that. But it's a little bit harder to call your vendors and try and negotiate uh, something or um, to scrutinize the P and L and find those um, opportunities to. Um, yeah. To to make accommodations and mm -hmm. and be creative, um, so it, it it like I said I think it's just, it's much easier for an operator like you could, it's it's so easy to save money. You just have to stop caring. You can stop buying the orchids, cut down on labor costs at the front desk. Um, you know, but uh, then you would not get you know any guests coming in, and they would not get that experience, right? So you also have to balance. You know, what is the guest experience going to look like? Uh, anticipate reputation management, you know, can be good or bad in this case. Uh, so I think, and make sure that the employees still have the hours to work for, if not, they're going to leave as well, right? So it's balancing everything and, and, and going back to the vendors, which I do regularly, mm -hmm. uh, it's fine to do because they, I would say, they expect that, you know. Uh, so I think it's, it's uh, as a general manager or as a department manager, we have to, to, ask ourselves those questions, right? And not necessarily be in our comfort zone and say, you know what, it's going to be fine like this. No, you have to anticipate and, and really make sure that we can achieve uh, at least the forecast, right? Top line, but also GOP. The way you approach that is the difference between short-term uh, short-term gains and long-term prosperity uh, and I think a lot of people get caught up in the short term if if we can only you know uh, make our numbers for this week look good right, right. Uh, then we'll be successful and you find yourself sprinting from week to week where everybody's feeling anxiety about mm -hmm. it it deteriorates your culture and then long term when you look back and you say what have we done up until this point you don't have much to show for it except for again a culture that's full of anxiety and uh, results that are 
quite frankly mediocre yeah you may have you may have hit those numbers but if you haven't done your duty as a hotel uh, in the community then what are we doing here right that's true it's true so we like to celebrate our early wins you know and uh, I like to brag a little bit about that with the team you know like we because uh, we have to excite everybody you know like you said it's a difficult situation during the pandemic and People are jumping from business to business, not a, not necessarily hospitality. So when we have uh, early successes, we usually you know share with the team, right, and celebrate. So it could be customer satisfaction, it could be revenue index, it could be you know achieving or uh, GOP or top line or anything positive. We like to to share and promote, so they get more excited for the next uh, months or. You know, so and and that's also very positive, you know, to the team to hear uh, instead of talking about the pandemic and you know anything negative in the world, right? So we promote positivity. Uh, at least we try uh, as much as we can. Great. We we are kind of at our time here, but I want to uh, end by asking you what your biggest learning experience has been um, you know you have so much experience in luxury hospitality you've worked in plenty of hotels all over the world um, but this is your first time opening Sable at Navy Pier and I'm sure you've learned a lot especially during the worst ever crisis ever recorded in the hotel industry what have been some of your biggest learning moments for you uh, yeah, you're right. You know, it's the first hotel on Navy Pier for the last hundred years. So this is a significant project that was uh, our ownership group, Akron. Uh, they are based in Switzerland, but they also have an uh, office in, in uh, the United States. So it's a huge investment. You know, this is obviously beyond Sebor. It's also for Navy Pier, the city. I mean, it's really enhancing the pier and getting more tourists, right? Pre-COVID, mm-hmm. 9 million visitors a year on the pier. So obviously, that hotel is going to be, should be, uh, busy year-round. Uh, so the challenge is to the seasonality, right? So obviously, uh, when the business uh, pick up, uh, we know that uh, summer, it's a given, right? Uh, the, the, the peak season uh, will be and continuously be busy, especially if the international travelers come back. Right. Chicago is known for that. And conventions come back, which you know uh, it's a bit soft right now. So, so it's playing with the seasonality of the the Chicago market. Uh, it's uh, adapting constantly with the you know the COVID measures, the restriction, the you know, uh, and anticipate. Right, you have to be very agile in in, in the process. And communicate. I think communication is very important. So to the owners, to the management company, which is Maverick Hotel and Restaurant, to the employees, what will happen, right? And our guests, the best we can. So we have all sort of tactic uh, to 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 share uh, those and. Uh, you know, do the best you can. Uh, mm-hmm. And you said I work in different countries in the world, which is true. So I'm very humble by that because it's part of a lifestyle for me to be exposed to different culture and different countries and and uh, ownership group and 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 also use all those experience to your advantage to really probe the right question and because working with asset management is also fun and it's also good because you're also learning, right? So you should not be afraid to ask uh, best practices from from their side because they have portfolio of hotels. So I'm never afraid to ask, you know, so what would you do in this case? Or what insight do you have for us to be better, right? So you also turn a little bit the conversation and and try to probe as much as you can and, and so for to make sure that hotel can actually succeed. Right. So putting your pride aside and you know instead of saying I know everything I don't need Correct. any help when you have experts because the hotel industry has so many different so like asset management is a great example mm-hmm. of that like as a primarily an operator mm-hmm. the asset mm-hmm. management discipline is is certainly there's overlap but very different um, mm-hmm. so I definitely uh, you know putting your pride aside to learn uh, is 
huge lifelong learning, never stop learning, right? Correct. Yeah, um, you never stop learning, you know, from everybody, which is uh, very important every day. Okay, well, good. Laurent, thank you so much. Thank you very much. <laughs> Appreciate it. It was great to talk to you. Thank Certainly. You.